this is Tribune, isn't it? I think, right? <laughs> um, it's quite hot in here, so everyone stay cool. Uh, there might be a bit of IT shenanigans in a moment, but we'll see what happens. Okay, so I'll leave you with Martin. Are we just outside, Martin? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You can stay here. Stay here. Oh, All right. Sorry. <laughs> Very happy. Yes. Vote of confidence today. Hello. Thank you for coming. I didn't think anyone I was going to go and see Tom. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. And if you saw any of the D Day things last night, it was extraordinary. Extraordinary. Lovely things. And these old guys talking about what they went through. And uh, just thinking of that, there's one chap there saying about the importance of uh, handing it on, if you like, bringing um, children, their children to see it, and the children, their children to see it, and never forgetting it. And they hope there's 600 veterans left. And it's hoping that this be handed on and that they carry on coming back to the uh, beaches of Normandy every year. And the Padre, can you saw the Padre? Any of you see this when you were drinking last night? <laughs> um, she had her dad's medals. Her dad died about a year ago and he was a Normandy veteran. And my dad, he's a Normandy veteran. He was, um, he took uh, first, he remembers, he told this story about uh, them all going to Portsmouth and the great big uh, hangers. Um, and it was about the 4th of June, something like that. <coughs> and Montgomery stood in front of them all and said, congratulations, you've been selected to be the first wave to go to Normandy. Sorry, to go to France. My dad was in the Navy. He went over on a tank landing craft and took amphibious tanks to Sword Beach. And the tanks went over, so he was a mile from the beach. And the tanks, and they'd go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. He did this for a month. And they, they were tied up at night next to a battleship. And all night, boom, 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 and he remembers that. So 70 years ago, yesterday, my dad was at Normandy. Do come in. <laughs> Have a seat. So 70 years ago, he was at Normandy. And on February the 19th this year, he died. He died in hospital after being there for nine weeks. And he had vascular dementia. His memory was going. And one of his best friends, who was an archdeacon, and they were best men at a wedding and things like this, one of his best friends had Alzheimer's. And at Christmas, he heard the story that his, um, his chap's children had gone to see him in hospital, he didn't recognize them, he was hitting out and being very violent. And he said to my mum, he said, is that, is that what's going to happen to me? And my mum said yes. And in January he had a fall. And he went to hospital. And he stopped drinking. And he stopped eating. And we had this meeting with the doctors there. And they said, look, we could force feed him and do all this. What do you want? And my mum, in floods of tears at 86, having to deal with this, said he would want to go. He would want to go. He doesn't want to have no memory. And so after that meeting, which was very traumatic for us, we let our dad die. He didn't want to live with no memory. Didn't want to live in no memory. How important is memory? What about our collective memory? 
And the story is about D-Day and the importance of the collective memory of D-Day. Should we teach D-Day to our children? How do we contextualise D-Day? Especially in these days where the journals were there at the ceremonies yesterday. There were German veterans there. Of course, 70 years ago, we were killing each other. What, what messages do we want to give to our children? What is education without memory? Do you want to think that up? So I'm asking a question today, something very important, I think. And that is about memory. Now, if you look at the new traditionalists, and probably a lot of them at the moment are at the policy exchange meeting that's happening, Southern Rolls, or whatever it's called. There they all are. And they're having a meeting about these things, and there, there's a lot of talk from them about the importance of memory, about the importance of teaching stuff and getting people to remember it and make sure that all happens. I mean, that, that's very much part of it. And I think, without memory, we are nothing. I don't know if you can wake up. I think, is it, is it the drummer from Slade or something like that? Is he, he's got no sense of smell or has problems with his memory or something, or both. <coughs> the, the thing about no memory, can you, if you had Alzheimer's given to you as a gift, would you take it? What are you if you're not memory? You know? And the same thing with a nation. What is a nation without memory? It's ready for you. It's ready for me. So I'm going to ask you a question here. See that. Do you want the lights off? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. You're going to see all my slides at once for some reason. I've never worked with one of these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is education conservative? Is it conservative? And if so, what happens to the progressive ones? Because if it's all about memory, then it's also about stories. And it's the way we tell those memories to each other. It's the way we say things. Here are the important things that we value. And they are memories. This is, I mean, when I... My daughter, what, what do I do when I want her to, to read a book? For a start, I don't want to get anywhere near an iPad. So, I, you know, wrestle that away from her with whatever is on there. I wanted to read books. What books do I wanted to read? Well, funnily enough, I wanted to read the books that I liked. <laughs> I wanted to have the memories I had, the ones I treasured. And when I'm being rose-tinted spectacle about it, I, you know, I go for Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh, we play poo sticks. That's a memory that I want her to have that I had. I want her to look at those lovely drawings of the Mouse's tail in Alice in Wonderland. I want her to have those memories. And I don't want her to watch the Walt Disney movie. I want her to have the E.H. Shepherd drawings in her mind. So I'm looking at things that I value. And this is very conservative stuff, really. Have a look at this. This is Hannah Arendt. with the person next to you, just, just to come to some sort of idea, whether you agree with what she's saying.
you've got a lot to say, which is good to hear. Um, I don't know if you are conservative, by the way. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I pride myself of calling myself an anarchist, so it's easy. <laughs> easy for me to say any of this. You say, I don't really mind. But um, if, you, if you're someone who's not, I'm going to try and give you a trick to try and take these things on board in a bit. Anyone got anything to say about that? Any well, we were saying it doesn't yeah. make any sense at all, any of it. Because, um, that's, that's all right, thank you. Because <laughs> um, education is a leading out rather than a containment. And also, if you were a conservative and you wanted to initiate the child in old traditions, what, you wouldn't be prote protecting the new against the old, you'd be initiating the new with the old. And then the, uh, protecting the old against the new, maybe that's the only thing that if you were thinking of what she's trying to say might make some sense. Okay, first, first of all, the um, idea of drawing out putting in. Anyone want to uh, argue against that point? I would argue against it. Your draw out is what putting in, yeah. I, I think there has to be something put in before you can necessarily draw something out. And whatever that is being put in at any stage, whether it's in education, whether it's at home, it's all education in the wider sense and you can't possibly draw something out of something empty but making sure that what goes in in the first place somehow is going to end up translating to implementary. It comes about, I mean, the drawing out idea, I think, goes all the way back to Plato, if not before. But this idea that we have within us the, the true human we are. It's called the pre-born self. Plato believed that we were well, reincarnated, if you like. There was a pre-born person. And what our life was about was trying to rediscover who that person was. So everything's drawn out from us. So in the Socratic way you can do this, or, or what, through dialectic, you can draw things out from people and find the true born person who was once in there. Now if you believe, Chomsky um, based a lot of his stuff on uh, literacy around that, his ideas, linguistic, sorry, about that, about drawing stuff out. So it's quite, it's quite an interesting idea. It's, you know, it's, it's grammar naturally within us, for instance, that Chomsky would perhaps argue, yeah. I was just going to say, if you were to say that was true, it's like the dichotomy between the Markian genetics and or evolution and um, Darwinian evolution. The idea that your parents have these thoughts and they're in your head, in, in their head, and when you're born, they're in your head, that that's not true. That's that's not what, what happens. The parents teach that to them, and it's the environment that that induces that. So we have to put something in, in order to, as, as we've said, in, in order for that to develop. The, the very nature of the reincarnated soul, I think, is, we, scientifically, we would say it is